Okay. So we were talking about target rich environments, and this is uh, certainly one of them. Uh, mutual funds, you can expect 20, 25 questions in what I call packaged products. This would include, you know, ETFs, ETNs, uh, that kind of thing as well. So. so if we want to start our own mutual fund, I don't know why we would. There are more mutual funds than there are Taco Bells. <laughs> there are actually more mutual funds than there are securities to put into them. But if we did that, we would have to comply with the Investment Company Act of 1940. And one of the rules under the Investment Company Act of 1940 is that we're going to have to classify ourselves as either a, let's just roll a slide here, as either a face amount certificate company. We don't really care about a face amount certificate company as a test issue. You know, we do care about management investment companies. So, you know, the, that's the technical name for a mutual fund. So, you know, you say, Dean, where do you work at? I go, I work at a management investment company. I go, what the hell is that? I said, I work at Fidelity. Or I work at T. Rowe Price. Or I work at American Funds. Now, it's going to be huge. We're going to talk about in this category called management investment companies, we're going to be talking about open-end funds and closed-end funds. And it is very testable to be able to contrast those two. It's either going to be diversified or non-diversified. So I kind of like this flow chart. And, uh, you know, there's going to be big time test fodder. I have a slide coming up, and I think it's one of the most target-rich slides in the entire deck. And it's just going to compare and contrast an open-end and a closed-end fund. Now, the last type of uh, investment company we have is what we call a unit of investment company. Low probability on your exam, but, you know, every once in a while it shows up. In a UIT, the investments are professionally selected, but passively managed. So, you know, uh, very popular with like municipal bonds, for example. I say, hey, uh, Sophie, this is the California Unit Investment Trust, uh, Nuveen 216. This is a fixed portfolio of uh, California municipal bonds. Selected right. for tax free and income. And I said, but listen, take a look at that UIT because the securities aren't going anywhere. That portfolio that you're buying proportion ownership is fixed. So it has passive management. And I might even add, uh, let me add one more note here a fixed portfolio. I saw what I thought was a pretty good deal for a, a unit investment trust. They don't typically trade in the secondary market, but boy, it had such a high yield. It was a, a bond portfolio. And, you know, but I was suspicious because the yield was so high. So I'm like, well, what kind of bonds are in the damn thing? And I couldn't find out what the portfolio consisted of, which I thought was another red flag about, well, gee, why, why won't you tell me what's in this thing, right? Now, as I said, the vast majority of our questions are going to be about open-end versus closed-end. Whoop. So as you can see, this is big time test fodder. So I think you made a really good choice about whether we should spend today's session talking about margin, three or four questions, or we, we should spend today talking about mutual funds. So, you know, uh, and by the way, I, I you know, this is the, how the vast majority of the retail public gets access to professional management. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, Clarice is a good friend of mine, but she's worked very hard to come up with $4,000. Now she calls up your firm and says she's got $4,000. We're going to say, well, gee, you know, that's not kind of not what we're geared to. Yeah. If she calls up like Franklin ones, they're going to say, hey, you know, welcome. <laughs> you know, so we're going to compare the difference uh, between the method of capitalizing open end fund companies. What we mean by that is they're only going to have to be able to have one class of equity, common stock. They can't issue preferred stock. They can't issue bonds. Now, be careful. RTFQ, read the full question. I did not say they can't own preferred stock. They can and they do. I didn't say they can't own bonds. They can and they do. What I said is they can't issue them. And, and the they, issuing is the capitalization part. So they can only, capitalization, capitalization can only be. That's, that's always what that means, right? How are we going to capitalize something? How are we raising money? Mm -hmm. Right. So identify the difference in pricing. We said that's huge. Now, here is my favorite slide. This is one of my all-time favorite slides for every FINRUN NASA exam. Because it's just really, really target rich. Now, I might suggest uh, taking a snippet of this. 
I know in the document I send you, you have this, but it, you know, it, it's so shrink that I don't know if you really can see it, right? So, all right, well, let's work our way through the left side and uh, talk about the test questions on the left side. Then we'll work our way through the right side and talk about those questions on the right side. So in an open-end fund, we're continually offering new shares to the public. And so if we're continually offering new shares to the public, not only are we going to have to comply with the Investment Company Act of 1940, what other act do we have to comply with if we're going to sell brand new securities to the public? Securities um, Act of 1933. Excellent. In fact, sometimes we even refer to the uh, 33 as the Paper Act, prospectus or paper, right? Is that testable? To call okay. it paper act? Well, well, no, no, just to help you. No, paper act, no. Just that's just in your own mind. You know, I think the way I like, what, you know, what Dean thinks is not testable, but uh, I'm just saying that if you think of this as this way, maybe it might be easier for you to get a question. For example, here's 33 and here's 34. And I just said, this is a prospectus act that is testable, but sometimes, you know, I think of that as the paper act. And then I think of 34 is the people and places act. You know, it's about people and places like the New York Stock Exchange, you know, insider trading. And so I'm just suggesting that if we think about people and places, sometimes I can just cover up a screen and say, are they asking about prospectuses, paper, 33? Mm. Are they asking me about people and places, 34? Okay, so we're going to be selling brand new securities to the public. So we have to give people a prospectus so they can make an informed decision. Now, one of the things that's nifty about an open and mutual fund is anytime you want, you can call and say, Dean, I would like to redeem my shares. Please pay attention to what I just said there. I didn't say you're going to sell your share shares. You're going to redeem your shares. You're doing business directly with the mutual fund. So, you know, that means that what we're talking about here is the primary market. Because remember, in the primary market, the issuer, in this case, the open mutual fund, is receiving the proceeds. And so that's what we're talking about in this, uh, this area here. So we redeem shares. So you say, Dean, I want to turn my uh, mutual fund back into money. You know, because typically what we do as investors is we turn our money into the security. And every time you do that, Sophie, that's called your cost basis. And then someday you want to turn your securities back into money. Right, and you're hoping that what you have is more money. And mm -hmm. so here you bought the mutual fund and now you say, Dean, I'd like to redeem. You say, how much money am I gonna get? I say, Sophia, I don't know. You know, we're always doing business based on the next calculation of the NAV, the net asset value of the fund. And you know, the Investment Company Act of 1940 says that we have to calculate that at least once every business day, right? Once a day. You know, um, by the way, some funds, you know, Fidelity Price is hourly. But, you know, you could certainly always do something, you know, more. You just can't do it less. Mm -hmm. So typically in the market session, uh, the mutual funds are going to take all the assets in the portfolio, minus all the liabilities, and come up with the net asset value, divide by the number of shares outstanding to get NAV per share. And then that's what you're going to get cashed out at. Now, there's a whole concept around this that's very testable. So I just told you whether you're getting into the fund. You say, Dean, how many shares am I going to get when I get into the fund? I say, I don't know, Sophie, because it's based on the next calculation of the NAV. You say, Dean, how much money am I going to get when I redeem? I say, I don't know. It's based on the next calculation of the NAV. That's a very testable concept. Okay. You know what that concept is called this idea that we're always doing business based on the next calculation of the NAV. That's called forward pricing. This idea that we're always doing business based on the next calculation of the NAV. That is testable. So, you know, say the idea that we're calculating in AV every day and do a business based on that. Now you have to meet that redemption request within seven calendar days.
So uh, <laughs> we have a legendary guy in the mutual fund businesses. His name is, uh, uh, he started uh, PIMCO. His name is Bill Gross. And uh, PIMCO is a huge mutual fund. And he's uh, the bond king, known as the bond king. Anyways, uh, you know, uh, one day he quit. And everybody's thinking, oh, my God, PIMCO is going to receive redemption requests. And on that particular day, when he quit and walked out, they received $38 billion in redemption requests. Oh my gosh. What I thought was incredible is they were able to meet every one of those within seven calendar days. And unbeknownst to Bill, his junior members of the team at PIMCO were kind of upset with him because, you know, they'd have like a bonus pool, of like 700 million, and he'd take home, you know, like 600, you know. <laughs> The, the junior people are going, well, really? <laughs> we get to eat too. So he, I mean, when he quit, they were all hat and saying, all right, woohoo, finally, <laughs> the Bond King is dead. <laughs> you know, uh, unbeknownst to Bill, they had a plan. They said, you know, someday Bill is going to walk out of here and we got to be prepared to meet these redemption requests. So they had the credit lines in place. And I, you know, we don't give operational words of excellence, but I thought that was really an impressive feat. Uh, mm -hmm. You can always get permission from the SEC. And I thought for sure PIMCO was going to ask for permission you know, to suspend meeting their redemption request so they could get things together, but they were they were ready. Uh, P.S., the other thing that happened is a lot of people were shorting the securities that PIMCO owned on the theory that they were going to have to redeem, sell those shares to meet the redemption request and didn't have to do it. I told you this is very testable that we can only have one class of equity. Now, what that means in plain English is we just have common stock. All right, we just have common stock. Now, remember, be careful, RTFQ. We can own preferred stock. We can own bonds. We just can't issue them. It's very important that you understand we're not doing business in the secondary market with an open end fund. You're doing business directly with the fund. That's going to be, as we go over to the other side, that's going to be the testable contrasting points. Now, the price is uh, based on a formula. And the formula is the NAV, the NAV, plus the sales charge equals the public offering price. So the NAV plus the sales charge equals the public offering price. So I'm just going to make up one here. I'll just make up one. Let me put that over here. And uh, we'll say that the uh, mutual fund has a net asset value of $9.15. I'm just making that up. Remember how often do we have to do that? Daily. Yeah, every business day, right? Uh, 0.85. Uh, by the way, the New York Stock Exchange has become more irrelevant to, you know, every day. I'm joking. But when they closed down, sometimes they went under, it didn't go under, but they just closed and the only person who really cared were mutual fund companies because they had to calculate NAV. So, you know, if the New York is not open, then, you know, we don't do this. So we don't do it Saturday and Sunday, for example. So here the public offering price is $10. You know, whenever customers are looking at two prices, the customer pays the high price, receives the low price. That's called the securities industry. And so, um, eight and a half test question. The most we can charge is eight and a half percent. I don't know of any mutual fund that charges eight and a half percent, but that would be the maximum limit. So, you know, if I'm trying to find what isn't an open end fund, because we just said an open end fund can't charge more than eight and a half percent. So the way we would do that is we would take to find a percentage sale charge is the sales charge divided by the public offering price. And we're not quite sure if this is an open end or not, because when we do that, we get the maximum limit. So my point is, if I did that, I came up with more than eight and a half, it would be a closed end fund. Because open end funds aren't allowed to charge that. It would just be a function of supply and demand. So eight and a half is our max test question. Now, uh, this came up the other day, and I just, uh, in social media, and I posted a little video for people on a slide. And, you know, they said, oh, Dean, I thought the X date is one day before the record. I said, well, if there's secondary trading, if there's secondary trading, then yes. Because remember, in secondary trading, the idea is that it's going to take two, T plus two to show up on the shareholder list. Mm -hmm. But here, we're doing business directly with the fund. And so here, it's not going to be all that time we spent on DERP. It's going to be DREP. What I mean by DREP is 
the mutual fund board declares the dividend. They set the record date. The X date is one business day after. And so it's going to be DREP instead of DERP. And so again, RTFQ. We got to be real careful about what we're being asked. All those dates are set by the board of directors. All right, so let's go to the right-hand side now, this slide. As we said, very target-rich slide here we're working on. It's one of the most target-rich kind of you know comparison contrast charts uh, on the exam. So in a closed-end company, the shares are fixed. There's no prospectus after the IPO, the initial public offering. The shares are not redeemable. You know, the reasons you buy, Sophie, a mutual fund is to get professional management, diversification, and ease of ownership. And so, you know, I say, hey, do you have the time, temper, and expertise to be managing money? You know, most people are going to say no. And I said, well, then you ought to hire yourself a professional manager. And you say, Dean, I can hire a professional manager with as little as $500. I said, there are men and women who sold their soul to manage that $500 for you. You know, as I said, for Joe Sixpacks, that's the easiest way to really get access to professional management. You know, so here I say, yeah, now call it hubris on my part, Sophie, but I'm not a very good prospect for a mutual fund. Because if you say to me, Dean, do you have the time, temperament, expertise to be managing money? I'm going to say yes. You know, and call it hubris, and so I'm not a good prospect. However, Sophie, I'd be the first to admit that there's certain areas where I should make an asset allocation where I don't have the time and temperament and expertise to be managing money. So for example, I'm a big fan, a long-term fan of Mexico. And I think I should make an asset allocation to Mexico. And one way I can do that is with a closed-end fund called the Mexico Fund, MXF. It trades on the New York Stock Exchange like a stock. The Mexican marketplace is very volatile. And I don't want my Mexico fund manager to have to meet redemption requests. So we say, listen, if you can't ha handle the volatility of the Mexican market, simply sell your shares to someone else for more than or less than you originally paid. So very testable distinction. One of our big time testable distinctions is that in a closed end fund, you don't redeem your shares. If you want out, you're going to have to sell them to someone else for more than or less than you originally paid. Now, the Mexico fund, if it chose to, could issue preferred stock. Remember this idea of capitalization? Mm -hmm. We raise money, right? And if the Mexico fund chose to, they could issue 6% preferred stock in the Mexico fund. And uh, tell the uh, you know uh, preferred stockholders, They'll pay them six, take the proceeds, make additional investments within Mexico. You know, if the Mexico fund chose to, they could issue Mexico fund debentures. You know, promise the investors 8%, take the proceeds, make additional investments within Mexico. So there we go, another contrasting test point. Now, the fancy word for what I just said, fancy word, is that open-end mutual funds can only have one class of equity common stock. And as you just see here, in terms of capitalizing my closed-end fund, I could have two classes of equity. I could have common and preferred. Not true, not true of an open-end fund, right? The biggest testable distinction, the biggest testable distinction is that these trades supply and demand, right? They trade in the secondary market, Supply and demand. You know, for example, the Mexico fund, I told you, trades on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker MXF. By the way, it is the only type of fund that could be trading at less than the NAV, right? Because there's no way that an open-end fund would ever have a NAV or something below that. So if I show you like a, a stock or closed-end fund, and it's, you know, the NAV is $9.15 and it can be bought for nine, that's got to be a closed-end fund, right? So this idea of recognizing which one. Now, when you buy a closed-end fund, it's just like buying, you know, a stock. You know, just call your broker, say, hey, buy a thousand shares MXF at the market, or you know, buy a thousand MXF on a limit of. It's like buying a stock, and that means you're going to pay commissions. Now, by the way, there's on the test, there's no such thing as commission-free test uh, test uh, trading, but you know, real world there is, but not in serious fantasy land. 
And then we said over here, remember, anytime there's a secondary market, it's going to be derp, right? Derp, remember, is our mnemonic or the chronological sequence of the declared date, the X date, and the payable date. And so you just got to be careful whether you're being asked about a closed-end fund where there's secondary trading, where the X date is going to be, as we've discussed earlier, one business day prior to record. Now, whether you're selling somebody an open-end fund or a closed-end fund, one of our prohibited practices under the code of conduct is we are never going to use the impending X date as an artifice. Did you love that? An artifice. That's a fancy word. We're saying I'm going to try and convince you that there's an artificial sense of urgency. If I say, Sophie, you know, hey, if you buy the fund today, man, you get the dividend. But if you wait till tomorrow, you don't get the dividend. And you say, well, Dean, isn't the fund going down or the stock or closed end fund going down by the amount of the dividend? I mean, isn't that really, Dean, just creating for me an unnecessary tax situation? I said, well, gee, Sophie, you're no fun. <laughs> Did I talk to your supervisor? You know, what is that practice called? I just walked you through. That's called test question, selling dividends. And that's a big time no-no, right? So it's not good if you get your series seven, you pass your exam, you come back and say, you know, I want to sell some dividends, do some breakpoint sales, do some churning, you know, open some fictitious accounts. These are all bad, bad things. All right. Well, like I say, man, that is one of my uh, favorite slides of all time. You know, there are easily three, four, five, you know, performance opportunities here for you on uh, January 9th. Okay. And you think that the, what you just said is very testable or likely to be show up? Okay. Everything, everything that I put on this slide slide is testable. Okay. All right. So yeah. So we're, you know, like I said, you made a smart choice. This, this, this right here. It blows margin out of the, the park in terms of how many performance opportunities we're going to receive. Okay. So we said the uh, second reason that people buy mutual funds is for diversification. You know, Bernard Baruch is a legendary Wall Street uh, investor. And he said, money is like manure and you ought to spread it around. You know, so one of the risks, Sophie, that we have as investors is called selection risk or non-systematic risk, you know. For example, there were 10 equally suitable ideas. I picked one of the 10. The other nine did fine. The one I picked went under. And so first test question is the easiest way to avoid non-systematic risk or selection risk is to diversify. The second test question is for most retail investors, the easiest way to do that is in the context of a mutual fund. Now, even though we have a mutual fund and it's a diversified portfolio, we're still going to be subject to what's called systematic risk, risk in the system, the density of securities prices to move together. So diversification, let's just make a note to ourselves, the diversification is important because it helps us, uh, helps mitigate, I'll put it in fancy words, mitigate, uh, helps mitigate or eliminate even, you know, depending how strong I want to be, selection risk or non-systematic risk. Now, even though that's helpful, we're going to have, a, there's still a type of risk that still applies to a diversified portfolio of securities. And what we're still going to be exposed to is what's called systematic risk. And systematic risk is still uh, something we we have. So, you know, what we mean with systematic risk is risk still prevails despite our diversification. This type of risk still is going to be there. So I don't care what, you know, mutual funds you have, if the market goes down 10% today, you know, your fund is probably going down. It's tending to securities prices to move together. Now, a mutual fund, if it wants to hold itself out as a diversified mutual fund, I mean, it's a choice of a mutual fund in terms of how they want to present themselves to the public. And most mutual funds do indeed want to hold themselves out as being a diversified mutual fund. And that just simply means that they've met the minimum requirements of uh, the diversification requirements under what we're discussing. So let's just get an example of I'm managing a $100 million portfolio. 
So if I'm managing a $100 million portfolio, I would have to have $75 million invested in such a fashion that no more than $5 million is any one position. Right? So that leaves me with $25 million I can load up. I mean, we're not trying to you know, get diversification. If I have a, an idea that I have a strong conviction about, I can still do it. Right. And I'm not supposed to be a principal stockholder. That makes sense, by the way, because we said mutual funds have to meet redemption requests. Right. And if you own 10% of the stock, then you are subject to the volume limitations of 144. Mm -hmm. Right. So a mutual fund is supposed to be what we call a passive investor in the portfolio company, not an active investor in the portfolio company. Right. So a good way to remember that is 75, 5, and 10. 75, 5, and 10. Now, if you don't meet it, no problem. You just can't refer to yourself as a diversified mutual fund, right? So. Share classes. So we have A shares, B shares, and C shares. And the thing that we're most worried about is, uh, you know, uh, investors not understanding what share class do they have? What share class do they have? And how does it work, right? You should always understand that before you buy. You know, I, I have a friend, Joe, and he called me and he said, Dina, you know, I'm having a problems reading my statement from my brokerage firm. And I said, well, that's a problem, Joe. I said, you know, and I thought he's a sophisticated guy, but I thought, well, maybe it's just Joe. And, and then I said, well, gee, that's not good. And I said, well, how are you paying your guy? And he said, well, I don't know that either. And I said, well, Joe, that's two huge red flags that you can't read your statement and you don't know how somebody's being compensated. I mean, you know. I always, so if we like to tell people how I'm being compensated so that, you know, there's, they can at least in their own mind know how it works. <laughs> so anyways, when he sent me the pay, uh, statement, I couldn't believe it. I, I, Sophie thought it was just Joe, but I thought that statement looked purposely opaque, that it was purposely difficult for somebody to figure out what the hell's going on. Mm -hmm. And then he had all kinds of bond funds. Now, listen, I don't know how many bond funds, mutual funds Joe needs, but a bond fund is a bond fund is a bond fund. So, you know, I kind of thought, gee, you know, if I were a supervisor, I'd be a little concerned. I think, you know, uh, he was probably taking advantage of uh, my friend, Jeff. Now, the A share is pretty straightforward. That's the traditional mutual fund share class that we've had for years, tried and true. And I know a lot of mutual fund families are going back to the A share. They go, man, why do we come up with all these different share classes to begin with? But this is a traditional one. So as we said, this is the NAV plus the sales charge equals the public offering price. And this is pretty straightforward. As we said, you know, uh, it's a maximum of eight and a half. That's testable. It's uh, always quoted as a percentage of the public offering price. So in our example, that's what I showed you. It's eight and a half percent in this particular example. And it can be, it's max 8.5%, yeah. but it can be 8.5. Oh, yeah. I don't I don't know if anybody charges 8.5 anymore. I mean, okay. uh, we call the technical name for mutual fund charging eight and a half is, oh, don't you love this? A full service fund. <laughs> now, if I'm charging somebody eight and a half, I got to show them a lot of love. Yeah. Maybe talk about breakpoints and letter of intents. And, you know, that's optional if I'm not charging somebody eight and a half. Uh, I love this, Sophie. A six and a quarter fund is called scaled down. Scale down from eight and a half. I don't even know anybody charging six and a quarter anymore. Uh, when I was a retail broker, Sophie, decades ago, uh, I sold the Franklin funds. And Franklin's funds load was 4%. And, you know, as a baby broker, I would have never made it in the business if I didn't have a mutual fund family like the Franklin funds, if I didn't have a wholesaler who would, you know, help me sell things. And I used to sell a lot of the tax free fund. And if you would invest $100,000 or more in the Franklin Fund, then they would lower that sales charge to 3%. I think it might still be that way. Who knows? That was decades ago. I started as a retail guy, ended up as kind of an institutional guy. But, you know, I still have Franklin people who are in my classes and stuff. And they go, gee, Dean, why do you love us? I go, listen, because I love you guys. Because without you guys, I would have not have been got where I was going, right? They had a, a wholesaler who, you know, can come out and help you sell. Remember that? The maximum gift or gratuity this guy can give to me. To sell the Franklin funds is a hundred bucks. Now remember what it doesn't count is normal deductible business activities. You know, my guy was Steve and he, you know, I'm a hard worker, so I don't have a problem with that. He goes, Hey Dean, why don't you invite your prospects and clients to a seminar and I'll come talk about professional management, diversification, ease of ownership, tax-free income. I go, woohoo. He goes, I'll pay for the pizzas and the sodas. That, that's fantastic, right? That's not a violation. Remember mm -hmm. normal deductible business activities are fine. You know, uh, these are called wholesalers. A great job, by the way. I mean, you know, these guys make a good living, rightfully so. 
And then, uh, you know, Chotsky's don't count. You know, I had a, an umbrella and I couldn't figure out where I got it. It was so beautiful. It said Blackrock on it. And the Blackrock guy said, Dean, I gave it to you. I go, oh, my bad. <laughs> Doesn't count reminder advertising. So things that have like your, you know, bags that you give to clients that have your name on it, that's not a problem. Okay, so let's uh, move forward here with our A share. Now, A shares have lower operating expenses and typically breakpoints. Now, be careful. A breakpoint, Sophie, is a good thing. You know, that's a quantity discount. You know, uh, I wish other businesses were like ours. You know, I was sitting at this hotel getting ready to check out and I saw all kinds of people paying different amounts of money. And I said, hey, listen, is there some deal I don't know about? You know, is there a way to get a better deal? He goes, well, Dean, what are, you, what are you asking for? I said, because I'm seeing people check out and they're paying all kinds of different rates. In my business, I have to tell people how to get the best deal. And he said, well, Dean, are you here on business or leisure? And I said, well, you tell me what the rates are and I'll tell you why I'm here. He said, Dean, if you're here on business, it's $300 a night. But if you're here in leisure, it's $150. I go, well, leisure it is. So the easiest way for us to stay out of trouble is to tell the client how they get the best deal. I say, hey, listen, I'm going to share with you how we can get the best deal and get that reduced sales charge, Sophie. I told you on Franklin of 3% rather than 4 And you say, well, Dean, I don't have $100,000. I say, wait, Sophie, you don't need $100,000 today because if you sign a letter of intent, a letter of intent, and you tell the mutual fund that you intend to uh, become a good customer, then they'll let you in at that reduced sales charge today. We're going to go over that. You know, I kind of think of like Costco. Costco has quantity discounts. I go, man, I don't need two tons of salsa, but gee, it's so cheap. Right? So the more you buy, the cheaper it gets. Now, the ace here test question is suitable for large investments with a long time horizon. And that is testable. So what we've got to be able to do is contrast the A share, the B share, and the C share. That's where we're going with this. The B share, the B share has a contingent deferred sales charge. And, you know, if you're in long enough, they'll waive that for you. And so you say, well, Dean, there's no way I'm going to come up with uh, in 13 months, the additional monies. So that's where we're heading. We haven't got there yet. Yeah, but I do want to put in, you know, X number of dollars. I do plan on uh, investing for the long term. Mutual funds test question are for the long term, for long term investors. And I say, well, I just had somebody send me a practice question, Sophie, this morning that they were struggling with. And it was a contingent, you're not going to have to do this on your exam, but it had a 5% contingent sales charge declining by 1% each year they were in the fund. And then the, basically the question said that after three years, now that's a 2% to get out of the fund instead of the five. And they got a, a practice question on that. You're not going to have to do any math in this, like that question. So the question, Dean, am I going to see this on the test? I say, no, but what you are going to see about the B share is making sure the client understands that contingent deferred sales charge, because what they're worried about is you using this in a misleading fashion and telling somebody it's a no low fund. You know, it's kind of like I joke, Sophie, you come into my nightclub and I say, hey, Sophie, no cover charge, free valet parking. And you go, wonderful. And then you go to get your car and I say, there's a $40 exit fee. And you say, well, Dean, you told me there was no cover charge. I go, well, there isn't. There's an exit fee, whether it's a if I'm charging to come into the fund or I'm charging to leave the fund, it doesn't matter. That needs to be disclosed and it's still a, a load. Now, these typically have higher operating expenses. You know, the reason is they got to pay the broker who got you involved. And this is suitable for smaller investments with a longer term horizon. The number one test question here is not misuse it, misuse of no load terminology. You know what I mean by that is somebody tells you, does this have a load? The answer is yes. Now, uh, this is a total inappropriate presentation. Um, this is misrepresentation. I say, Sophie, you know, if you get the B share, you don't pay to get involved in the fund. The fund pays me. Kind of like using your travel agent, you know, to book an airline flight. You don't pay the travel agent. The airline does. And it's total misrepresentation because you don't own the airline. You know, you are an owner in the fund. And if the fund is paying me, that means you're paying me really, right? I mean, one way or another, you're being you're being compensated. So that's the test question there. And the last share class we have are the C shares. And the C shares uh, have a 12B1 fee. That is testable. A 12B1 fee is a promotional expense. 
a promotional expense. It's not part of managing the money. So, you know, maybe you get like what I call a Sesame Street trick question. All the following are associated with 12B1 fee, except it would not be the management fee. You know, the management fee is what the investment advisor is charging the fund to manage the money. That's not part of this. This is to for, you know, uh, advertising and marketing and brochures and all that kind of stuff. Now, the C shares typically have a 1%, uh, you know, 12B1 promotional expense to pay the broker for getting involved in other things. Under Over the life, it can't be more than three quarters of 1%. But the test question is that, you know, if you're going to be one per, paying 1% every year, I just gave you an example of Franklin funds where you pay 4% once and you're done. Mm -hmm. So after this fifth or sixth year, paying 1% every year, this is not going to be very suitable for somebody who has a longer time horizon, right? Because 1% a year over 10 years is going to be like 10%, right? So the test question here on the C share is recognizing that this is going to be an inappropriate investment recommendation for you know somebody who is going to be owning the fund for long term because that promotional expense never goes bye bye. And so that's the test question again. C shares are suitable for people with shorter time horizons, not less than a year. But what we mean by that is they're not going to make you come up with you know four years or five years. It's just the general understanding that if you're paying me one percent a year forever. And or four percent once and be done. That maybe that would be the appropriate recommendation uh, based on that scenario. Now Vanguard is truly a no load fund, and what we mean by Vanguard is if it's a Vanguard fund, for example, it's NAV. Remember, plus the sales charge equals the public offering price, and a no load fund that sales charge is going to be zero. Now, woo. That's a true no-load fund, true no-load fund. Now you can charge up to, you can charge up to one quarter of 1%, that's testable, and still refer to yourself as a no-load fund. So one quarter, 1%, you can still refer to yourself as an OO fund. You know, uh, it's now part of BlackRock, but there used to be uh, Wells Fargo Nico, and that was Barclays Global Investors, and it was you know, had a lot of you know permutations of uh, what it was. But uh, I was tutoring the guy who was running the you know the the business, and at that time they didn't have trillions; they had like hundreds of billions. Anyways, they have a twelve B one fee of one quarter one percent, and they refer to their their products, their mutual fund products, as no load and. I was teasing about one quarter, 1% 1 that that's pretty damn cheap. And he said, Dean, if you do the math on one quarter, 1% 1 on a trillion dollars, that's still a boatload of money. <laughs> I think he was getting upset that I was teasing him about his, you know, his 12B1 fee. <laughs> so, uh, by the way, uh, so Vanguard, I don't think Vanguard would ever do this, but Vanguard has like $4 trillion over there. You know, if Vanguard wanted to, they could implement a one quarter, 1% 1 uh, fee and call it a, you still call them no load funds. I, I don't think they would ever do that, but. Okay, so here we go with this idea of how you get the best deal. So here's an exhibit. You know, this varies from, uh, you know, mutual fund to mutual fund based on the prospectus. So we're looking at a mutual fund that has the following breakpoint schedule. And we're talking about the A shares. And so you say, uh, Dean, how much should I invest? And I said, well, so if you invest $25,000 or more, you'll pay a 5.5% load instead of a 6% load. And you say, well, Dean, I don't have 25,000. For my initial investment, all I have is 18,000. And so it looks like with that initial investment of $18,000, you're gonna pay a 6% load. And I say, well, listen, do you think that over the next 13 months, do you think over the next 13 months, you might be able to come up with an additional $7,000? Because what I uh, think we might want to consider is filling out test question, a letter of intent. Now, Sophie, uh, I wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, you don't take advantage of this because of my lack of communication skills. There is no way you can be hurt by filling out this letter of intent. 
So if you'll simply say to the mutual fund family that you intend over the next 13 months to come up with $7,000, we're going to let you put that 18 grand into the fund at five and a half percent. So that's a way for you to get the reduced sales charge. So you say, well, Dean, what if I don't come up with it? I said, well, Sophie, as a result of paying five and a half percent instead of six, you're going to be able to buy some additional fund shares. And you say, well, that sounds like a good thing. I say, yeah, it's a wonderful thing. Whatever extra shares you get, we're going to put them into an escrow account. And if you don't fulfill the letter of intent, we're simply going to back flag the account. We're going to sell those shares, redeem them. And the account will look as if it would have looked had you not done this. Now, that story I just told you is not testable. What's testable is knowing that the customer cannot be hurt. This is only a way the customer ends up in a better place. There's no way to fill out a letter of intent and be in some worse position later on than you are today. right? So sometimes the way we say that is that this is a unilateral contract, meaning it's only binding on the mutual fund. It's not binding on you. Right? So that's why I was kind of saying, you know, my sales customer must be weak if I can't get you to do this. Right, because you know, so you say, well, Dean, there's no chance I'm gonna, you know, be able to come up with the seven grand. So it's just a waste of time for me to sign the letter of intent. I said, well, do you think over your lifetime you might be able to come up with some uh, more money, or you know, maybe you're gonna reinvest the money? He said, well, I hope so. I said, well, let's at least get you rights of accumulation. Rights of accumulation. Now, with rights of accumulation. You're not getting a reduced sales charge, Sophie, on that $18,000. You're going to pay the 6% and you're not getting any reduced sales charge. But when you do cross on that and all subsequent investments, you'll get the reduced sales charge. All right. So, you know, again, no reason you wouldn't want to do that. So you don't sign the letter of intent. You don't sign the letter of intent. And you call me and say, damn, Dean, I won the lottery. I should have signed the letter of intent. I said, well, good news. You can backdate it 90 days. Test question. It can be backdated 90 days. Now, that backdate is inclusive of the 13 months. What I mean by that is if you, you know, uh, wait 60 days, you got 11 months left to come up with the money. Right. So, very, very testable. So, again, this reduced sale charge is uh, based on how much you invest. Now, remember, uh, let's try one more version of this. So, we said breakpoints are good but you got to read carefully. So let's try another version. You say, Dean, uh, how much should I make my initial investment for? I say, Sophie, you ought to make your initial investment $24,999. And you say, why? I said, so I can make a 6% commission instead of a 5.5% commission. Ooh. Now we have a thing called the code of conduct. We talked about this earlier in the hour. We said one violation of the code of conduct is selling dividends. You know, the code of conduct is the ethical behavior that associated persons and broker dealers owe customers. And so you got to be real careful on the test. Breakpoints are good, but a breakpoint sale is bad. You know, that's when I'm trying to maximize my commission by avoiding the breakpoint. Right, so, by the way, 24999, I should say, Sophie, don't you have another buck or let me give you one or let's fill out a letter of intent. You know, I had a guy who worked at a mutual fund. Uh, he was in a 24 class and we were, you know, talking about you know, being a supervisor. And, you know, I joke as a supervisor, you got to believe in human depravity and original sin. But he said, Dean, I was looking at the customer's mutual fund app and it wasn't suspiciously close to the break point, but it was close. And he said, so, so I waved the break point. I go, wow, that's pretty damn uh, good, uh, nice of you. And he said, well, Dean, you won't believe what happened. Uh, the rep called and cussed me out and said, how dare I lower the sales charge and reduce his commission? And, well, that's a huge red flag. I mean, because remember the customer ends up better here getting that reduced sales charge. He goes, well, at that point, Dean, I thought maybe it wasn't isolated. So I decided to pull some more mutual fund apps and see if a pattern emerged. And he said, Dean, I found out he was doing it, you know, more than this particular thing. I called his supervisor and said, but if he's doing it here, he's doing it elsewhere. So that's a big no-no, right? A big no-no is when you're trying to, you know, maximize your commission. So again, just make sure you read uh, carefully, right? So breakpoints are good. Right? Just make sure you're being clear what the question's about. If it's a breakpoint, good thing. And if it's a breakpoint sale, that's a bad thing. So the breakpoint is the quantity discount. The breakpoint sale is avoiding it, is avoiding it.
All right. So the break points, as we said, are great things. Those are quiet discounts. And those are available to corporations and other business entities. Uh, investment clubs are not allowed to pool their purchases for purposes of meeting the break point. So no investment clubs, that is testable, are going to be allowed that. You know, a lot of funds have a combination privilege, meaning, you know, Franklin doesn't care whether you have X number of Franklin funds at Merrill and X number of funds at uh, Franklin funds at Morgan Stanley. As long as it all adds up to the break point, no problem. You know, a lot of uh, mutual funds will let you combine your purchases with that of your spouse or that of your kid in the UTMA account, no problem. And we said it's very testable to know the breakpoint sale is a bad thing. That's when you try and avoid your, you know, avoid the breakpoint to get maximize your commission. So we said very testable. The letter of intent is good for 90 days, very testable. We said it can be backdated 90 days, 13 months, and backdated 90 days, very testable. Uh, you want to be able on the test to contrast a letter of intent with rights of accumulation. And the testable distinction is rights of accumulation. Remember, you don't get to reduce sales charge up front. And uh, the money we make you does count. On letter of intent, it can't be money we've made you that gets you to the break point. It's got to be new capital, fresh capital. But rights of accumulation, it can be. Now, uh, I told you, Sophie, that I'm jealous that you're in San Francisco. I hope you don't float away today. Uh, but, uh, you know, I spent a big part of my career there. And uh, there was a guy with a little coffee cart who was my favorite guy. And I used to go down every morning and get a cup of coffee. Anyways, I, if you bought 10 coffee cups or nine coffee cups, he gave me, he gave you the 10th one free. And so, you know, uh, that's rights of accumulation. I don't get the 10th coffee cup until I buy the first nine. I have to prove I'm a good customer. But anyways, uh, I was telling him that he should change it to a letter of intent. You know, he gave me my free cup and I said, I think you should give me the free cut up front. I'd like you to switch from rights of accumulation to a letter of intent. He goes, well, Dean, what's that? I said, I'm going to sign this card that you're punching saying that I'm going to buy 10 coffee cups and you're going to give me the first one fr up front free. He goes, well, how am I going to do that? I mean, I, I, the way you're explaining this to me in a mutual fund, there's like an escrow account. How am I going to escrow, you know, coffee cups to make sure you pay or whatever? I go, yeah, I haven't figured that part out. Anyways, I forgot my wallet. And I came down and uh, I was, oh man, I forgot my wallet. He says, he says, oh, Dean, this one's on me. We're going to do that letter of intent thing. I go, woohoo. I got on the <laughs> switch from, uh, you know, making me prove I'm a good customer, just saying, hey, I am one and treat me as such. So you got to be able to contrast those uh, two things, right? And the, what's the no time limit again? So the no time limit means is whenever you cross, it's from now to ever. Remember, got it. Okay. you got to have this done within 13 months. Because if you don't, we're going to back flag your account. So what we mean is, so my original example, let's just go back here. Let's see if I can bring that back up. I think I can. There we go. So let me just now go back to the slides. So there was our example, right? Mm -hmm. And we said that in this letter of intent with your 18 grand, you had 13 months to get that done. And if you didn't get it done in 13 months, I'm going to back flag the account. What back flag simply means you're going to look like it would have looked on day one had you not signed the letter of intent because we're escrowing those extra shares. And then as we said, this rights of accumulation, it doesn't matter when you cross. There's no time limit. So it could be two years from today or four years from today, whatever it is. And by the way, there could still be a violation here, right? So if you give me 18 grand without signing a letter of intent and six months later, you call me 18 grand, no letter of intent. And you say, Dean, how much should I send you? I say, send me $6,999. That too would be a violation, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm putting it at the break point. By the way, if you do cross, so you say, well, Dean, I understand that you, know, you told me about the letter of intent. I gave you 18 grand. I get it. It's, you know, I didn't do the letter of intent. Here it is now. Uh, but I'm going to send you um, $14,000. And so, Dean, my question is, do I pay the six on the seven and five and a half on the seven? I go, no, Sophie, the entire amount that crosses the break point gets the reduced sales charge. So the entire 14 grand is going to be at five and a half percent. So even if you gave me seven, you only made it by the hair of your chinny chin chin. Mm -hmm. You would still get that reduced sales charge on the entire amount. So again, my point being that you can be guilty of a breakpoint sale in a rights of accumulation again example, if again, you are trying to avoid the breakpoint to maximize your commission. Always a big no-no. Always a big no-no. All right, so you say, pay attention to this one. Sometimes when I'm doing debrief, it's hard to figure out what people are seeing. It's kind of like, you know, I joke about going into the cave to slay the dragon and, you know, people are trying to describe to me the dragon they saw. And I'm like, okay, well, gee, I don't know what this is. Yeah. Uh, 
it finally it dawned on me what people were encountering on the exam. So, uh, you know, sometimes it's because it's obvious to me, but it's not obvious to new test takers about what they're encountering. So I say, uh, Sophie, in the Franklin tax refund, you know, you're younger in your career, but, you know, let's, let's say uh, you're in a growth fund. Let's put you in a growth fund. You know, if you're one of the senior persons there, maybe you need some tax-free income. doesn't matter. We're just talking about a mutual fund. And uh, this is not your 401k. This is your personal account. And I say, Sophie, what do you want to do with the dividends and capital gains distribution from the mutual fund? And you say, well, Dean, to be honest with you, I don't need the money. I said, okay, well, let's go ahead and reinvest that into the fund. And so we call that, and this is what people were telling me they were seeing on the test. We call that a DRIP, a dividend reinvestment program. Now, it doesn't have to be a mutual fund. It could be, you know, for example, years ago when I started out investing as a new investor, I would uh, enroll in ExxonMobil's dividend reinvestment program. And I would tell ExxonMobil, instead of sending me the dividends, just buy me additional ExxonMobil shares. Now, the first test point is the IRS says that, Dean, whether or not you get the money, you could have had it. So whether I tell the mutual fund to reinvest the dividends and capital gains distributions, the IRS says, Dean, you could have invested the money. And that's the same as getting it. So that what that means is you're still going to get a 1099. And what I'm trying to tell you, Sophie, is you're going to pay taxes on the dividends and capital gains, even if you choose to do what with them? Reinvest them. Yeah. You know, I would, it doesn't mean we don't want to do it. So, you know, I'm going to get a 1099 from ExxonMobil saying this is the dividends that Dean received. I didn't really receive it. But, you know, the IRS says, yeah, you did. There's a 1099 and you owe taxes on that. So that's our first point. So let's say you're a senior partner at the firm and you are in the Franklin, California tax refund. And, you know, uh, big time, money. let's say you give me $500,000. Again, this is not a retirement plan. This is $500,000 you've already paid taxes on. Now, the Franklin, California tax-free fund has muni bonds. And the senior partner we're discussing, you someday, you know, is a resident of California. And uh, you say to the Franklin, California tax-free fund, I understand the dividends represent the interest I'm receiving from the muni bonds. And so those dividends from the Franklin, California tax-free fund are tax-free because the dividends represent that pass-through of the interest on the muni bonds. Uh, I say, but I don't need it. Buy me some more funds, shares. And again, that wouldn't be taxable because that represents the dividends. But if Kaplan, or if, excuse me, if a, Franklin sells some bonds and there's a capital gains distribution, that's going to be taxable. The only component of a muni bond that's tax-free is the coupon. So again, if you reinvest the capital gains distributions into the Franklin California tax refund, again, 1099, it's going to be taxable, right? So now, if you redeem, so here we're talking about the distributions you're receiving from the mutual fund. Now, the other thing we got to deal with is your cost basis. Remember, that's how much you actually paid for the mutual fund. And remember, if it was a no load fund, you paid the NAV. And if it was a loaded fund, you paid the public offering price. The cost base always represents what that looks like, right? So uh, when we come back on our 30 minute break, we'll pick it up there with the tax treatment of mutual funds. Again, I think you did a wonderful, I made a good choice there about uh, doing that instead of uh, margin, because that's huge. I mean, we can still do some margin. Uh, I would think we'll be done with mutual funds by the end of our, our next session, so. Any okay. questions here before we take our little break, our little lunch break? Um, I don't think so. So the only thing that's actually the only thing that's testable with that automatic reinvestment, that drip, is that uh, it's taxable. It's a taxable event, but that's there's right. not a sales charge. Yeah, that's right. You don't have to pay. We're not going to charge you public. So regardless of there was a load, you're not paying the public offering price to get back in there. You're going to be reinvesting okay. at the NAV. So your original okay. investments at the pop, but your reinvestments are going to be at NAV. Okay. Okay. Got it. All, All right. right. See I'll you in see you in a half hour. Right. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.